putting on. There we go. Okay. So um, this event is sponsored by both TCOT and uh, Councilman Lisa Parshley. And so um, our thanks to Lisa for being a co-sponsor of this with us. Um, she sponsors this as a way to try to help the public um, be aware of climate issues that go along with the climate mitigation plan. So um, we have four panelists tonight. Um, and so the way we're gonna do this is each of them is going to speak in turn, sharing information with you and I'm going to ask that people hold their questions until um, after all the presentations are done. However, if you have questions you don't want to lose track of while the session is going on, you can put them into the chat box. Um, for those not familiar, you can find the chat box at the bottom of your screen if you move the cursor around. Um, and so I'll be sort of monitoring those. If you do have a question that's sort of like you you actually don't understand it doesn't make sense something the speaker has said you can put that in the chat box and I may ask them while they're going along but otherwise we'll hold the questions until the end um, and then I will also be calling on people who will have their hands up at the end so um, that is the format that we're going to have and um, I want to uh, introduce sort of in order um, who our speakers are going to be. We have um, Garen Thatcher here speaking with us first. Um, then we have Matt Tobin here. Um, then Adam Crawford. And then Chris Van Dahlen. And they'll each say a little bit to introduce themselves more to you when it's their turn. But um, thank you again for taking time out of your evening to come and be with us. Um, we're excited to have this presentation because um, people often ask about the climate mitigation plan, like, okay, yeah, what the government is doing about it, what are we doing about it, um, and, you know, this is the part of what you can do about it. These are things that, that you will be able to do in your own home. So, um, with uh, no further ado, I'm going to introduce Garen and, and let him start. Hi, everybody. Um, let me just quickly move into screen mm -hmm. share mode here. Okay. Um, my name is Darren Thatcher. I am with a company called Swiftshire Energy Services. We do a couple different services for uh, primarily the new building and construction, residential construction um, uh, business of doing uh, third party verifications for energy credits and meeting energy code um, for their homes. The other thing we do is a lot of, of high performance homes. So if people want to build um, net zero homes and things like that. Um, that's the majority of our business. A lot of the, the other thing that we do is we do residential existing home energy audits. Uh, so we'll come into a home, um, do an evaluation, and then tell you what you need to do to improve, um, improve that home. We are truly a third party. I'm gonna emphasize this several times. We do not sell a product other than our inspection service. So we're not a window company coming and telling you you need new windows. We're not an insulation company that's coming and testing and then doing that. We're truly, we, we remove ourselves. Um, we don't have any relationship with, uh, with the trades and companies such as that. We, we do uh, partner with uh, quite a number of various organization, organizations around the region and around the country. Um, so we're authorized to do lots of different verifications on, on uh, properties. What I want to talk about tonight is, is just a little bit about exactly what is that energy audit. And it's basically, we can go into an existing home or a new home and um, determine pretty, pretty precisely how much the load and the energy usage of that home would be and indicate if things need to be improved, anything from um, duct leakage to home leakage to just even just suggestions like swapping out your light bulbs. Um, but really we're talking we're talking about what will reduce the amount of energy that your home utilizes. And an interesting thing that's come up really heavily in the in the last several years 
is as more homes have been uh, studied to what makes them more energy efficient, this, these same efforts are making these homes healthier as well. And I'll, and I'll briefly touch on that if we have time. Um, really, and this, this I think speaks to that, we, an energy efficient home um, really lends itself to fewer respiratory symptoms. We see a lot of asthma issues go away. We see a lot of uh, fewer days missed work, fewer kids are, are missing school if they live in an energy efficient home. So what's included in an energy audit? Basically, um, we do five different things in your, in your home. We come in, we do a blower door test. Now I've got it, the next slide is gonna tell you exactly what a blower door test is. We test your ducts and we're looking for leakage um, in your ducts. We do, we pull out infrared cameras, um, determine where we can see heat loss or energy loss going through the walls, around the windows. We do quite an involved um, visual inspection where we get up into the attic, we go down to crawl space. Um, we kind of just poke around and see what we can find. Then we report um, out what we found and make recommendations to you. And it takes about 60 to 90 minutes, sometimes as much as two hours. Um, and again, like I said, we're, we're not um, going to be recommending um, a certain company. Uh, we might just say, we recommend you do this, but it's up to you to, to who you, you uh, hire to come in and do the, do the actual work. I wanna quickly go over what a blower door test is. Um, essentially what we're looking for is where your home is leaking. Every home is leaking. Uh, if you took all the leaks around the house, uh, my house is pretty difficult, it's about 25 years old. Um, I've done one of these. And as it sits right now, if I added up all of the leakage in my house that's going on right now, I would have about a two foot by two foot open window in my house year round that that much air is coming in and going out. The idea is to get that down to inches rather than feet. And uh, that's what we help you identify and find. Um, we do this by hooking up a blower door. We usually hook it up in your, in your uh, um, front door. We go around, we close all the windows, we close everything that should be closed. Um, we leave all the interior doors open because we wanna measure the whole house. We hook up uh, this blower door, it's got this large fan um, here and basically we, we hook this fan up and we hook it up to um, one of these, this device on the right hand side. We put negative pressure on your house. So we're sucking air out of the house. And then this computer will monitor how much air is being um, vented out through this door. By doing that, we can uh, also walk around and, and feel where things are. It's been really interesting. We can walk into an upstairs place and we can see the carpet come up off the floor by sometimes two feet um, with the amount of, of air that's coming in from the garage up through uh, um, the, the rooms above the garage. And then it just lifts that carpet right off the floor. Um, sometimes these uh, homes are, are very, very leaky. So this is the first test we do. Um, just to have an indication that the computer on the right kind of shows what the code is moving forward for a new construction house um, to even just pass code to be given an occupancy permit. A uh, home has to have five air changes an hour. This home right here, the computer shows 3.3 air changes an hour. That means the entire air of the house um, was replaced three times in one hour. The lower that number, the better. Um, and really the idea here is we wanna draw air from a good source. We don't wanna draw air from the attic. We don't wanna draw, draw air from the garage and we don't wanna draw air from the, um, the crawl space. If we can draw air from other good places, um, then we're okay. We do want air changes. Air changes are a good thing. Next test we do is a duct test. So this picture on the left is one that we see in a lot of older homes. Um, you've all heard of duct tape. Well, duct tape is what was used to hold ducting system together many years ago. 
um, it's gone out of favor because guess what? It dries up and you can um, have a problem. In this situation here, what you're looking at is not is two problems. One is is you can you're you're putting all your expensive heat and heated air and cooled air. You're just letting it grow out go out in your attic, that, which says you're no good. The worst case is is it creates a vacuum and you can suck air from your attic down into your home. So you're talking about air that may be up there. You might have all kinds of infestations. You've got dust, you've got the open floor cell um, materials for the insulation. You don't want to be sucking that material back into your home. So that's a really bad thing. So we hook up a, this fan to your duct system, usually a cold air return. We go around, we seal up um, all of the, the vents and the, the, uh, everywhere that the air is normally supposed to come out. And we again hook up that device that I showed you a picture of earlier, and we measure the amount of duct leakage. And generally, we can find and identify pretty quick if you've got a, a situation like a picture on the left. Um, a lot of times, we're just recommending to the picture on the lower right is a uh, material called mastic, and or a lot of the tradesmen call it kooky. It's basically a really heavy, thick glue. Um, paste that you you brush on and it seals up all the joints and it's kind of the industry it's the industry standard now for for sealing up the ducts. Next thing we do is uh, hopefully on a day that's uh, not like today if we can get out where it's either really warm or really cold outside we can definitely see um, areas of heat loss or cool loss cool entry into your home. And the darker the color, the, the worse it is. So the upper left corner, you can see this is kind of a window sash. And we've got either a lot of, on the left side of this window at the bottom, we've got a lot of air coming in on the left side of us. That's probably a sealed, a seal has gone bad. Picture on the upper right, um, there's some, a lot of missing insulation in this home in the walls. Um, picture on the on the bottom. Uh, there's a lot of attic insulation that could uh, could be replaced there. Um, the picture, the two pictures on the left, those are pretty easy to fix. Just some more insulation or a window seal. Picture on the right, that's a little harder to solve with uh, with insulation in the walls. Like that. So those are the three main tests that we do. Then we kind of move into our visual inspection. And we start poking around the home, looking at insulation level depths, um, how much insulation is in the, in the crawl space. We look at your filter condition. We look at the general age and condition of your uh, heating and air conditioning system. We look and find out if you've installed a, an upgraded uh, thermostat. Um, today's uh, newer thermostats can help you immensely with, uh, with climate control in your homes. We do a pretty good analysis on your appliances, give a, a quick look at all of your lighting. Uh, uh, we want definitely uh, encouraging folks to switch over to LEDs, looking at hot water delivery systems and, wa and uh, then the water delivery. So how much uh, water flow are you having? We get all of this work done. It takes about uh, 60 minutes to kind of run through your, 60 to 90 minutes to run through your house. Um, then we prepare a report and um, get it back to you and um, basically give you our recommendations on things that we would say, okay, if everything we found, are you, is it looking good? Is it lot not looking good? Or, or an ordered list of things that we think you could, uh, you could start working on. So um, that's kind of what the, what the uh, process of doing an audit looks like. What we, there are some limitations. So first off, I wanna make sure everybody understands we are not a property inspection service. We're not a company that comes in and tells um, uh, you in a pre-sale or when you're selling your home, everything's wrong with your house. Um, there, there have been some homeowners that before they actually go through the house, um, they have a regular property inspection service come through and then they also have us come through as well just so they can adjust the, uh, the offer on the home. 
We're not a furniture moving service. So if you've got a, a large bed stuck over one of your vents, we need to cover that vent, but we're not going to be moving your bed for you. Um, we need to get access to crawl spaces. If I, in, my, in my house, if you open up the door to where the crawl space is, um, there's a lot of stuff in there, right? So it's in the hall closet. Uh, we would like all that moved away um, before, before we get there. We have to insist that there's an adult in the home when we're there. And just as a kind of a, a, a thing, I mean, we go into everywhere there's a vent. We need to look at, at every, everywhere in the house that heat and air conditioning goes to. And so if you've got an area in your house that you don't want visitors in, um, you know, we might not be able to do the full duct test. Um, the other thing is a lot of people start asking a lot of really good questions. We kind of have to limit our, our, our guys that go out in the field to about 90 to 120 minutes. So we do have to charge extra if, if there's uh, a lot of questions that take us into the, the two uh, over two. It's well worth the time. I do want to talk a little bit while I've just got a couple minutes left is, is the idea of how, how much of this is also impacting healthy, the healthy homes industry and um, how many people are starting to find a linkage between what's going on with makes the home energy efficient and what makes the home healthy. And the idea of having, um, if your home has inadequate ventilation, if you've got an error, if you've got contaminants in any way coming in through either biological uh, materials or air pollution, these are the things that are gonna cause your home to be less than healthy and could cause you to be more sick, have asthma, your kids to miss school more often, um, things like that. This is, this is happening more and more. And, and if you look at this uh, picture of, of where contaminants come from on a normal basis on the inside of the home, um, there's, and there's one box that's missing from this picture, but the garage is a huge area. Um, a lot of new homes around the state, especially in Oregon and Washington, um, new, new homes are being actually built with a little fan that's built right into the garage that every time you close the garage door, this fan kicks on and vents out all of the um, exhaust from your car for five minutes and then the fan will automatically shut off. Um, how many of you in your garage have the air handler in the garage and then have you know, 50 gallon, old gallons of paint and solvents and all kinds of stuff out there that's getting sucked in with the air from your air handler in your garage. Um, so these areas where you're drawing um, contaminants from into the home are critical that uh, you identify those and you can seal those out. Um, and this is a, an interesting slide. This kind of shows in the, in the four areas of energy efficiency, we always talk about the, the insulation or, or how the home is, is framed in, so how it's sealed. Um, the heating system, um, how it's vented, and how, what your cooking supplies are, all of these things have a direct impact um, on, the left, on the right side of this picture of health-related areas. And so um, we are finding that there's a, a double-edged uh, opportunity here for us with the opportunity to um, reduce our footprint um, from a consumables and an and a, um, energy part, but also to improve the health. And especially as we know over the last 18 months, um, how much time we spend on our homes, how much time we think about ventilation, um, I just think back all the time to, you know, what we found is air travel because of the amount of, of circulation of air and new air from a known good source. Air travel has been very safe over the last, the last year. Um, and homes that have a good um, ventilation system put in it are better than homes that don't. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you. Um, I've got uh, my email and also my business partner's email on here is just a, a final slide. Um, 
please uh, write this down or um, I can post it out in the chat later on. But if you're interested, please give me a, um, um, an email or, or call me at any time. Again, my name is Garen. I'm the second one on this list. And uh, thank you so much. I'll be staying on and, and uh, answering any questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Garen. Um, we have friendly panel to panel uh, effort here. Chris has a comment to make. Yeah, Garen, I, I was hoping uh, before we move on, um, and maybe you could open your slideshow again, uh, that I could ask you a question just about um, of all the different things that people can do in their own homes to improve efficiency. Um, you know, what are some of the, what's the, some of the low hanging fruit and, you know, I, you know, one thing I think people might be asking is, is what, what, are, which of the measures have a tendency to be able to pay, pay back for themselves and energy savings in a shorter period of time and which ones take longer? Um, that's one of the best things that a blower door test will show in most homes that we do it's, it's aged seals. It's doors that don't close completely. It's um, a lot of times you can, we can hook up a blower door and you can walk up to all of the light sockets, the, the sockets around on the wall and you can feel a breeze coming through those. Well, that's air that's coming down from the attic, down between the drywall and your exterior wall, even if there's insulation in there and it's coming out through there. And so with just a really simple caulking or uh, one of those um, the foam, um, can, foam sealant, um, you can start sealing up those things really, really easy. Um, we've seen people take their uh, air changes per hour from six or seven down to four or five just by doing things like that. Um, the ROI on that is like 20 minutes. Um, a bottle of air sealant, uh, a foam sealant is less than 10 bucks, um, you're gonna see impacts on that really fast. The other thing that's, I hope for a group of folks who are in this meeting, if you still got incandescents and high usage light bulbs, um, I don't know how many people have not made that switch yet, but I know when I made the switch, I made it in one month, I went from all incandescents and, and don't and, don't uh, steal Adam's thunder. That's what he's talking okay. About. Sorry, sorry. Um, that's another huge no brainer. So Chris, we go for quick ROI things. I I don't want people to drill to pop hole in their wall and fill them full of, of insulation if they don't need to. I don't want them to go out and buy new windows if they don't need to. Everybody always talks about windows. It's about a ten year ROI. I'm looking for a month ROI. Um, and, and that's though it's, it's, uh, ROI, you mean return on investment and right. about yep. payback, just yep. a little acronym yep. alert there. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Good, good clarity. Um, the, uh, a lot of times if, uh, what we found on these things, we've, uh, uh, hooked up a blower door and, uh, not a blower door, but a duct tester. And luckily we vented it out in the garage because we were surprised at just how much dust and crap was in the duct system um, that's just blowing around the house um, and, and blowing dust and contaminants around. Um, air filters, we've had furnaces that were completely plugged up because the people hadn't um, changed their air filter for four or five years. Um, so they were, they were probably headed towards a failed uh, air handler, which is about $5,000 replacement if you have to buy a new furnace. Um, if we can get that system back up and running with a new air filter, you're, you're it's just, you know, an air filter is 20, you know, nice air filter is 20 bucks. And you could save yourself $5,000 right there. Well, thank you, Garen. Um, I'm noticing time, and I think we will go on to Matt. So thank you very much, Garen. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Tobin. I'm with Alpine Duckless, and I'm going to get my slides going. Um, <clears throat> so I think this is probably, we probably bought into this already, that everybody on this meeting is here for a reason, and um, and climate change uh climate change is one of the reasons we're here. So when you talk about clean about clean energy and, and being able to heat your home with the lowest impact on the environment and global warming, 
um, electricity is really a way to go. You look at, um, this is a slide by the uh, Peter um, Sunker. Matt, Matt, your slides are not showing. So give it oh. one more try there on the screen Sorry. share. Can you tell I'm a rookie to sharing on, there we go. Sharing on, uh, there we go. No, now can you see my no, slide? Sorry, still, still not working. Um, I know you can do it because you did before we started. So, <laughs> so um, share screen and here we go. Share. There we go. Yay, it's working. <laughs> okay. Thank you everybody for bearing with me. Um, so you can see these diminishing, these diminishing lines here with wood burning wood burning fireplace on one end and electric heat on the other end and gas furnace or stove um, very close to the clean end as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, this kind of, I think people intuitively understand this, that electric heat is, is cleaner, it's easier to manage. Even if, even if the original source of electricity is dirty, like a coal, coal filed, fired power plant, um, you know, there's opportunities to there's opportunities to filter when all that's generated at a single in a single place. Um, you know that some in, there's been impact with Unit One at Transalta being retired in 2020. Unit Two is being retired in 2025. Um, so that's kind of a net win, uh, a net win there for taking some some dirty energy offline. Um, sorry, I'm I'm messing around with my slides now. Okay. Um, so, and, and what's the, what the industry is saying is that as wind and solar continues to grow, that these carbon producing, you know, coal fired power plants are going to close and that it's, and that by the middle of the century, power companies are going to become primarily transmission companies and the microgrid is a real thing and the impact of of uh, homeowners installing solar is a real is a real impact, and it's going to become a it's going to become a big part of our a big part of our grid. <clears throat> um, and what we are experts in at, at Alpine Ductless is energy efficient ductless heat pumps. And um, this is a lot of people are familiar with heat pumps. They're, they've been popular for decades. Central heat pumps are a, are a very efficient way to operate as well. Um, ductless heat pumps takes, takes that efficiency a step further by eliminating the duct work. The distribution system that, that many homes here in the Pacific Northwest have, that, uh, that system of ducting that's running through an attic or through a crawl space actually reduces the efficiency of the heat that is distributed through your home by 20 to 25%, sometimes more. Um, Garen was talking about some of the problems that are inherent with, with duct, with duct systems. And, you know, one of the problems is that very few of us are down in our crawl space on a regular basis. Very few of us are up in our attics in a regular basis. So there could be ducts that are disconnected or broken and blowing conditioned air that we're paying for into an unconditioned space. Um, when you have a when you have a ductless heat pump, that energy exchange is happening right inside your home. There's no there's no energy penalty for the types of losses that that a normal house with ductwork would suffer. And a normal house with ductwork, there's there's two kinds of losses for blowing through ducts. There's pumping losses because you're pushing air through ductwork, and then there's radiant losses because most of the time ductwork is located in unconditioned area, the unconditioned space in the house. So during you know, the seven months out of the year that we're heating, we're pushing warm air through cold ductwork in a cold attic or a cold crawl space. And I think just, it doesn't take much deep thought about that to understand that you're wasting quite a bit of energy there. Um, Garen also touched on um, the importance of, of clean air in your home. And that's another place where ductless, ductless heat pumps can shine. Um, the way that these systems run is based on the refrigeration cycle. So they work exactly like your refrigerator. There's always a cold side of the system and a warm side of the system. And in the summertime, the cold side of your system is inside your house producing, you know, with the air conditioning. And in the wintertime, the warm side of the system is in your house and it's delivering heat. Um, one of the limitations for the uh, the central heat pump that many of you may have in your homes already is that typically below a certain ambient temperature, those, those systems have to be switched over to an auxiliary heat source. So a typical, 
a typical central heat pump for a home in this area at about 45 degrees or so are switched over to an auxiliary source of heat. Um, that could be natural gas, that could be electric heat. At any rate, that's probably less efficient than, um, than delivering that heat through a heat pump. It's definitely, less, it's definitely less efficient if you're at warmer ambient temperatures. At cooler temperatures, there's less, temp there's less heat in the air to, uh, for us to transfer into the home. Um, a ductless heat pump doesn't need or have any auxiliary source of heat. So there's many systems that we, that we sell that are able to provide all of the heat for a home um, all the way down to five degrees, um, which we of course don't need in this, in this climate. Our climate's design temperature, so meaning the, the coldest temperature that we get for an extended period of time is 23 or 24 degrees, depending on who you talk to. And the right, the correct system, uh, uh, we take all that into account. So if, if, uh, if you're looking for a sole source of heat, then we'll make sure that a ductless system is able to take care of your house at 23 or 24 degrees. If you're looking for a supplemental source of heat, it doesn't need to provide all of that, but it would provide down to the temperature that, that you need. Um, <clears throat> um, this just talks, this slide is, uh, is Bonneville Power Administration Northwest Ductless Project, and this talks about the relative cost of heating. So if you have any of these systems on the left-hand side of the slide, fuel oil, propane, um, or electric furnace, those are much more costly ways of providing heat into your home then if you look on the far right hand side, which is a ductless heat pump. In general, a ductless heat pump will deliver about three times as much heat per watt as a zonal electric system. A zonal electric system is a cadet wall heater or a baseboard, um, radiant heat panels, those kinds of things. Um, and so just talking about the, um, you know, ductless it has positive impacts on air quality. Um, it has positive impacts on your home's energy efficiency. Air conditioning could have even have a positive impact on your home's um, resale value. And so uh, ductless is really a win-win. That's really all I have tonight. Matt, could you just comment, does, does the ductless use any electricity or a little bit more about, you know, how it's actually working? Sure. So the, a, a, a ductless heat pump is basically refrigerated. It runs on the refrigeration cycle. And the refrigeration cycle is based on the principle that heat seeks cold. And so when we create a, a cold side of the system, heat is attracted into the refrigerant. And then that refrigerant is pumped to the inside of the home. And the, the, uh, through the refrigeration cycle, there's a phase change where the refrigerant condenses. It goes from a vapor to a liquid. And when it does that, it releases that energy that it took on. Um, then the refrigerant is pumped to the outside of the house where it goes through an evaporation cycle and it turns from a, uh, from a liquid into a vapor, creating a very cold coil. When you create that cold coil on the outside of your house, heat is attracted into the coil and into the refrigerant and it continues through that cycle again. And I'm not sure I addressed your question, Lynn. My question was whether it uses electricity at all. It, it does use electricity. So the, the mo a modern uh, ductless system is an inverter driven, has an inverter driven compressor, and then also fan uh, fans on the indoor and outdoor unit to help transfer the air. So they do, they do use electricity, but typically again, to deliver the same amount of heat as an electric, uh, a space heater or cadet heater or baseboard, they use about one third the amount of energy to deliver the same amount of heat. So in the picture you have there, you can see a unit. And so if people were thinking that this is something they might want to do, that they might want to, you know, get a heat pump, what should they anticipate in terms of sort of where it would visually show up in their house? That's a great question. So the, a, a lot of the, one of the biggest objections that we, that we get is that uh, most people that have seen ductless have seen an appliance on a wall. So typically they're, you know, they're, they're about three feet wide. They stick out from the wall about eight to 10 inches. They're about 12 inches tall. And that's the most common, that's the most common configuration. That's, that's called a wall unit. And they normally are placed high on a wall. 
Um, the, in the slide that you're looking at right now, those are called a floor unit and they take up a little bit of space. You can see they'll even fit under a window in many instances. Um, <clears throat> and you do need a way to bring room air into an appliance and condition it and then blow that air back out into the room. There's also units that sit up within the ceiling joists of a typical, of a typical room. So that's called a ceiling cassette. And one of the advantages of those is that they're really, they're really kind of not in your visual field. So if you're thinking about, you know, this is a beautiful home, I've spent a lot of time and energy making it beautiful. I don't want an appliance on my wall. You don't, you don't necessarily need to have an appliance on your wall. You might be able to have something in the ceiling or some other type of, we've also done some custom applications where, there, where all of the interior equipment is hidden as well. And would that be in one room, all rooms? The, the most common configuration that we that we sell and install is in a single room in a single um, a single main living space. Um, Puget Sound Energy uh, is provides some really generous, uh, really generous rebates. Uh, virtually every customer of Puget Sound Energy is eligible for at least a single rebate. Um, Manufactured homeowners are oftentimes eligible for up to about three thousand dollars in in rebates from Puget Sound Energy, um, <clears throat> which of course leads to the uh, cost question. Like, if people were thinking about doing this, are they looking at a major investment, or with rebates, not so bad? Well, we're not going to get to the thirty day uh, the thirty day simple payback that Garen was talking about, unfortunately, but um, but. Typically, the, the lowest cost of entry that we see for a stick-built home is somewhere around $4,000 completely installed. And then as a benefit of that, you know, if you have a, if you have a uh, cadet wall heaters or, or baseboards in your home now, we hear from customers all the time that they're, that they're wintertime bills, so the, you know, kind of that six-month core of heating air, heating period. Um, that their bills are reduced by about half. So typically out of a typical power bill over the course of a year, typically 60% of that is for heating your home if you heat with electricity. And yeah, and it can, and so it can have a major impact on reducing your, your monthly spend. And, you know, again, we're not gonna get to the 30 day, the 30 day payback, but with some really generous um, rebates from Puget Sound Energy, um, we have seen customers in the in the four, five, six year payback period. <laughs> um, cost of entry for a stick built home is again could be four thousand dollars. For a manufactured home, is oftentimes less than two thousand um, dollars, <clears throat> and then that would be probably for a single zone system where we're heating the main living area of the house and with the connected rooms getting some benefit from that heat and cooling as well. And then multi-zone systems can go up from there. We we do homes all the town all the time with a unit in every room where everybody has temperature control, everybody has air filtration in their room, and that kind of thing. And you know, they you, you can maybe build these systems as big or small as you like. Yeah. So uh, a couple of last things. Uh, a lot of people here in the Northwest don't typically have air conditioning in their homes because we have a fairly <clears throat> cool temperature. But if you do this, then you basically are going to have air conditioning, aren't you? Right. The, the, all of the systems that we sell are um, rebates tend to be a, a part of the transaction for every system that we sell. Puget Sound Energy has really the best rebates, but all of the almost all of the utilities around have some rebate. And in order to do that, you need to take away that you know you need to shrink that 60 percent of that average of that average electrical bill so the utilities are giving rebates because you're going to be saving a lot of money on heating it's also a much more comfortable way to heat your house so <clears throat> most people are familiar with a furnace or a cadet or a baseboard where those systems are either on or off and typically i i've done some analysis on the um on the central uh, central furnace that I have in my home, in addition to my ductless system, and it runs about an, in the in the the thick part of the heating season. It runs about 15 minutes an hour, so it'll run for four or five minutes at 100%. It'll shut off. It'll let my house lose that heat over time. It'll come back on. It'll run for a few more minutes. It'll shut off, and your temperatures fluctuate like that. Typically, you know, five to seven degrees, sometimes more. 
Um, the way that a ductless heat pump we, works, and one of the reasons it's so efficient, is these systems are driven by an inverter and by a smart controller. So the controller is constantly measuring the temperature of the air and the heat and the heat rise. And it's comparing that to the output of the system at any given moment. And it's making really small adjustments in the output in order to maintain your house at that temperature. So rather than a conventional heating system says, I need to get your house to that temperature and then I'll shut off, this uh, a ductless heat pump says, I'm gonna get your house to that temperature and I'm gonna keep it there until you tell me not to. Great, thank yeah. you. Um, last question and then I'm gonna go to Adam. Um, so, uh, I think you're saying that some air is coming in and out of the house through this system. And so if there is, uh, we'll say, smoke from forest fires, what happens? You know, typically not. These, these, these systems are, um, this is basically a refrigeration system for your house. And it's a refrigeration system that will heat or cool your house. But it's using the existing air inside your home. And unless there is a special provision to accommodate the need for outside air, then there is no air transferred from the outside of your house to the inside of your house with the ductless system. Now, with that said, these systems are quite effective at filtering the air because they run almost all the time. I'm, I have a ductless, a ductless system that I'm looking at down the, at the end of the room that I'm in right now. And it rarely shuts off. So it's constantly filtering the air. And because it's doing that, they become a great opportunity to add, um, if, you're interested in, if you're interested in reducing the impacts of um, you know, wildfire smoke and things like that, there are ionizing uh, purifiers that can be added on to, um, to a, ductless, a ductless heat pump head in order to reduce some of that particulate in, inside your house in addition to what the filter already does. Great. Thank you, Matt. You just really covered a lot. Thanks, Lynn. Right. I'm going to go to Adam now, whose ears must be burning from <laughs> all the things that have been said about PSC's great uh, rebates. Yeah, all right. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Here we go. All right. Well, first of all, thanks for, uh, for having me here. My name is Adam Crawford. Uh, I am the outreach manager for Kittitas County um, and Snoqualmie and North Bend. Um, but I also work closely with our uh, energy efficiency programs, uh, specifically with um, residential energy efficiency. So uh, this screen shows you a little bit of the different programs that PSC has. Uh, that includes new construction, retrofits, multifamily, and single family existing. Uh, we will be taking a look at some of the, the lighting aspects, the water heat, uh, and the home appliances. And then down in the right hand corner, uh, you'll see some different tools and resources. So if you go to pse.com slash rebates, you'll be able to see all the different available rebates that there are both for gas and electric customers. Um, those sometimes change, so it's always good to figure um, which ones are updated. And then I'll also touch a little bit about the PSE Marketplace where you can actually get rebates um, as you purchase new LED lighting fixtures or smart thermostats. So we will start off with water heaters. And so I'm gonna focus on the electric hybrid heat pump water heater, which is a mouthful. Um, what that does is it moves heat rather than generates it. So you use two to three times less energy. With that specific type of heat pump, um, you can select specific water temperatures, choose different operating modes. And when you're on vacation, you can actually put it into a vacation mode, um, which keeps it at a lower temperature, uh, in turn saving you uh, both energy and money. Where those are usually uh, installed is either in your garage or your basement. And so they have the ability to dehumidify damp spaces. Uh, and then one of the best things is those water heaters typically come with 10 year uh, warranties and have an average lifespan of 13 years. And so is it right for you? Uh, there's a lot of details that go into um, what type of source you use to um, 
four water heaters, um, where you're located, um, where that heat pump is going to be located. And so we actually offer an interactive um, design tool at PSC.com that will help guide you through the process of figuring out if one of those water heaters is right for you. Next, we'll touch a little bit about rebates that are available right now for um, different type of, types of water heaters. Uh, the one I just went over, uh, there's also rebates for natural gas storage water heaters and natural gas tankless water heaters. And so again, if this is right for you or not, you can go ahead and um, go to do that, uh, that tool, or you can go to pse.com slash rebates, and it'll give you kind of a rundown of what's available. Um, and my personal favorite is calling and asking an energy advisor. And so the number is located right there, but they're able to uh, look at your home's previous consumption um, and kind of give you an in-depth look at uh, how your home uses energy and also explain uh, the rebate process and also um, help guide you through the process of purchasing um, something like a water heater for your home. Uh, next, we'll talk about lighting, uh, specifically LEDs. As touched on before, LEDs are the most efficient light bulb on the market. Um, for those of you who have not made the switch, uh, I highly encourage it. Uh, at my house, we made uh, a complete switch in um, over a 24 hour period. Um, and the nice thing about these LED lights is um, one, you're using a lot less wattage per bulb, but they all also offer different, uh, different colors for different rooms. So for example, in our laundry room, we have this nice bright uh, white light. And then in some of our, our living room and our dining room, we have a nice cool um, soft yellow color. And so variations with those lights, but these LED bulbs use at least 80% less energy. Uh, they have dimmable options and they last for 13 to 25 years uh, longer than incandescent bulbs. And then if you see the two pictures on the right-hand side, uh, that actually gives you uh, a look at our wild horse wind facility. So um, I actually started with PSC back in 2007 at that visitor center. And uh, back in 2007, uh, LED lights were not uh, the mainstream at that point. They were very expensive. Um, and so about seven years ago, we went ahead and retrofit the entire facility. And so we went from uh, 10,000 watts of usage to just over 2,000 watts. Uh, and then you can see the ceiling uh, in that visitor center is about uh, 30 to 40 feet high. Uh, and the nice thing about installing LEDs is we won't have to get back up there and switch those lights out for another 13 to 25 years. Moving on, we'll talk about uh, appliance rebates. And so PSC does have rebates that are available for your clothes washers, uh, your Energy Star certified electric dryer, or your heat pump dryer. And so again, if you're looking at appliances for your home, you're looking at replacement or maybe upgrades uh, that are more energy efficient, uh, I'd recommend going to the PSE.com uh, website and looking at different qualified models that are available, available for your home. Uh, appliance pickup and recycling. So this is a really great program that will recycle uh, your old refrigerator or freezer. And so any equipment that was manufactured after 1992 uh, or earlier um, is qualified, it has to be running, but is qualified for this free appliance um, pickup. And PSE will actually write you a $25 check if you do recycle that old fridge or freezer. So if any of you um, here on this call have a old freezer or fridge that you need to get rid of, you can go ahead and get a hold of us and we will get that recycled for you. Uh, we just had a, um, a campaign with the Hands On Children's Museum to see how many uh, appliances we could recycle on May 22nd. 
and we ended up getting about uh, 26 appliances recycled. And so that was uh, a really good campaign and happy to, uh, to get those off of the grid. Adam, could I ask you a question about yeah, that? Sure. Um, as some people on this call know, um, our state legislature just passed uh, a law to regulate more hydro hydrofluorocarbons, which are uh, what are typically in air conditioning systems. And part of why they did that was because um, in an international treaty that has been made for, I don't know, five years at least now, um, uh, th those hydrofluorocarbons were identified as one of the worst greenhouse gases there are. Uh, apparently ref refrigerators do leak them. And I've been told that the, the absolutely worst part is right at the end of the life when the refrigerator is being deconstructed, um, they used to just release that out into the air. And so in that uh, uh, program that you have where you're reclaiming them, are they starting to address that about, about how to um, get rid of the hydrofluorocarbons without releasing them? Uh, that is a great question, Lynn, and I don't have that answer for you, um, but I would be happy to, to look into that uh, and get that answer for you. I would love it if you could uh, do that, and I'll even send the answer on to other folks afterwards. Absolutely. Um, and one thing I would just flag to people's attention too is there will be different refrigerators coming on the market because of the treaty and because of the state law. And so if you're starting to think about a new refrigerator, then that might be a thing to have in your mind. So go ahead, Matt. I'm, I mean, Adam, I'm sorry to have uh, interrupted. Oh, no, no worries. I only got a couple of slides left. So uh, smart thermostats, uh, right now we have a $75 rebate on smart thermostats. Uh, these are great for keeping your home more energy efficient. Um, and these smart thermostats are able to be controlled over Wi-Fi. Um, they can learn the heating and cooling aspects of your home. Um, and they're very affordable, especially with the, the rebates that are offered right now. And so there's, there's smart thermostats that um, you know, start at $150 and go all the way up to $350. It all depends on um, how much technology you want within that thermostat. Um, but in order to, um, to participate in that, uh, you need to be a gas or electric customer, have a centralized system, um, and you're able to get one thermostat rebate per household. Um, and then for the uh, homes that are electric only, uh, there are semi new to the market is the line voltage uh, connected thermostat. And so these are primarily for your baseboard or, or your zonal heating uh, or radiant heating. Uh, and you can get up to five thermostat rebates per household. And those are for the different, uh, it's five of them because those are for the different zones within your home. And um, when you say the smart, thermostats, you're talking about ones that are programmable so that they will turn off while you're gone at work and not heat the whole house while you're gone. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you're, um, with some of the new ones, you can actually control, uh, control it from your phone. And so if you are, if you're away in the winter uh, on vacation and you're about half an hour away from home, you can go ahead and turn up your, your system to, to a comfortable degree. Uh, right before you get home. And and would you say that that does make a really big difference to people's um, consumption of energy if they have it low while they're gone, uh, you know, from work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's been interesting times uh, for some of us since we've been working from home oftentimes and um, haven't had the ability to to lower um, lower that heat. But yeah, I think it's is people are getting out more and, and having the ability to, um, to control your home's uh, temperature uh, more precisely will definitely help with your efficiency of your home. Uh, and then last thing, uh, just talking a little bit about the PSE marketplace, where essentially it's an online marketplace that allows you to get PSE rebates 
on the spot. And so you don't have to fill out any paperwork afterwards, after the purchase and, and send that into the manufacturer or send that into PSE. And so uh, on that marketplace, we have LED light fixtures, we have uh, shower start thermos, thermostatic shutoff valves, again, a mouthful, um, and we have those smart thermostats. And so one point about that uh, shower start thermostatic shutoff valve is uh, you attach it to your shower. Um, and what it does is it allows the water to heat up. And as soon as it gets to a certain temperature, I think 100 or 110 degrees, it'll actually shut off. Um, and uh, until you get into that shower and you pull that, uh, that nozzle, it will uh, save you essentially hot water. And so that's how those work. All right, so that's that's what I got for you. Um, okay, so could I just ask um, of the different appliance things that you were talking about, if somebody was going to try to prioritize, like, okay, I think what I should do first to save energy, do you have a recommendation to them about, you know, kind of where to start in the appliance world? Yeah, so... Um, from all of the things that I presented on, of course, I'd start with LEDs, um, but then I'd look at smart thermostats. That's something that, uh, that is affordable, um, and there are rebates available for that, uh, as well as installing some of those, um, the shower start valves. I personally have not used one yet, but um, it should be over the next couple of weeks. Um, and then you'd start looking into um, water heaters and, uh, and your, your washers and dryers based on, um, you know, affordability of it and, and, and you know, personal choice. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Adam. All right. Chris Van Dalen is up. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, uh, so... I work for a company called Capstone Solar, so I'm going to talk about why going solar is such a great thing right now. Um, but but I want to just say that I'm actually here today, kind of representing myself as the as the chair of the South Sound chapter of the Northwest Eco Building Guild, and as a board member with Thurston Climate Action Team. And so my presentation is not about my company, but but more about just solar in general and how great it is, uh, great an opportunity it is. Before I get into it, though, I want to just say about all the presentations that have preceded mine, um, you know, a lot of us are looking at this and the kind of the, the tone of the conversation or the, the, na the, 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 the nature of the conversation is like, okay, how can I improve my home? And uh, there's a lot of folks that in this community who don't necessarily even have the ability to improve their home. They might live in a rental home, for example, or they may have, you know, limited income and not really be able to afford some of the upgrades that we're talking about. And so one thing to keep in mind in this conversation is it's not just about, you know, our home or my home, it's about everybody's home. And all of the things that have been presented um, really are equally, if not more important to the less advantaged people in our community. Um, you know, the people of color communities, national research has shown that people of color communities uh, spend about three times more uh, in terms of percent of their income on energy than uh, than more than you know the, the average family, and um, and that, that just makes it you know like they're paying more for energy uh, than than they can even afford, and much less being able to make the improvements on their own homes. And so we really need to look at this as a community and how you know that that's where the Thurston Climate Mitigation kind of comes back to that the, to the to the plan so that we can. Um, not just uh, you know get a few get the folks homes retrofitted that who can afford it, but but really we need to look at how we can make this available to everyone, and um, and so just you know kind of thinking about that and just the equity considerations as we go forward, um, both whether it's regard to uh, you know being able to access an energy audit, do weatherization, uh, upgrade a heating system, or even you know um, access some of the PSC programs and rebates that are available. It's not, it's not available to everyone equally. And so we need to work together to make that happen. So just a little bit of, a, of an intro to kind of put a little bit of this in perspective. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about solar and how, uh, how easy it is to become, to go solar now. And let me do my screen sharing thing here. 
share. There we go. Wow. So if you've been living in this community for a little while, you know, one of the one of the biggest reasons we think about going solar is because uh, we want to make a difference on climate change. And we now have the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan that allows us to act collectively uh, on some of these issues. And, um, you know, ultimately, uh, it's about transforming our whole energy system and our and our relationship with energy. And th that's a that's not only good for environment, but it's also going to it's going to kind of decentralize the ownership of the of the energy uh, production system. So, not only on the uh, community scale where we need to you know try to bring our uh, the ownership of our power back home, um, but we also uh, it, it affects us individually. You can actually own your own generating plant and put it on your roof. It's called solar, and so it's really empowering, and it's more affordable and accessible than ever. Um, I don't need to go through these these reasons why to go solar very much, because obviously um, it, it's changing our, our energy grid to reduce carbon emissions from uh, dirty energy sources. So we're reducing pollution. Um, every, every home that goes solar inspires and educates their neighbors. Um, so we every home that becomes a, a solar home is filled with people who are now solar ambassadors. So we can you know scale up the, the availability of solar just through inspiration, education. Of course, uh, it's a great thing for saving money. Um, you know, it, it you know we talk about turnaround or payback. Um, it's in that kind of ten to fifteen year range most of the time nowadays. But um, but it's uh, but it really can save a huge amount of money on energy bills because uh, energy rates keep going up and up every year. And if you get so once you get solar, you lock your price in and you're insulated from future inflation. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, it's a it's an investment in our whole community to try to solve some of these bigger issues that we're facing. And then we'll go to the next slide. So one of the questions that comes up is, well, does solar even work in the Northwest? And I want to uh, uh, I want to thank and uh, acknowledge uh, the elder in our community who is here tonight, uh, Kirk Hafner with South South Solar, who, who really taught us all that solar can work in the Northwest. It's, you know, the technology has improved and become more efficient. And so it works even on cloudy days. Uh, and we get, uh, you know, we actually have more days of sun and more solar energy here in the Northwest than they have in Germany, which is one of the biggest users of uh, solar power in the world. And so, yes, solar does work here. It can work on homes, um, both uh, single family homes or tiny homes. It could work on uh, multifamily residential buildings. Businesses uh, are really benefiting from solar. Uh, we can talk to Lisa partially about why her business is going solar and what that's doing for their bottom line um, and also for their, uh, their, their footprint. Um, and then of course we have community solar where folks who can't afford or, or maybe they don't even own their home can also be a part of going solar. So multiple levels where this works. And uh, we have a bunch of great companies in our community that are, um, you know, some of them are, are local, some of them are in the region. And we, um, you know, we have all these wonderful options. And so when you think about going solar, there's, you know, we've got uh, South Sound Solar and my company Capstone Solar that are here locally in, in Olympia. Um, you know, farther north we have ANR Solar that's installing solar all over the state and the region. Puget Sound Solar and Artisan Electric are more up in the there's in the Tacoma and um, Seattle area. And uh, you know, you may know some other companies that we could mention later. But um, you know, all these companies are doing great work and contributing to the solution. Of course, Olympia Community Solar is a special case, and I'm going to talk a little bit, little bit more about them at the end. So how does this work? Um, how do you save money with, uh, with solar? Um, you know, the real thing, one of the real questions is that, you know, like if you're producing all this sun and solar power in the summer, how do you get to use that energy in the winter when you really need it, when it's cold outside? Um, luckily in Washington state, we have something, a policy called net metering that requires utilities to give you a credit for every uh, kilowatt hour of energy you produce from your solar array that's in excess of what you use you get to actually get a credit for that one kilowatt hour for one kilowatt hour. And uh, then later on, you see that on your elect on your utility bill, you see how many credits you earned each month. And then in the next, um, uh, you know, later in the year, you get to use those credits until they're gone. So you get, you get to actually use the solar energy you produced in the summer in the winter. There's a little video here that I'm not gonna take time to show because we're a little short on time, but it explains net metering. 
um, just do net metering Google uh, and, you, and you'll find it on YouTube it's, if you want a little more detail on how that works. Oh, oh just push play. Didn't mean to do that. Okay. So um, uh, there's, as, as I mentioned, all the different companies, they all have a slightly different process and I don't really know uh, how other companies do it. I, I've been in, involved with Capstone Solar here for as, as a sales rep for them for about a year now. And um, I'm going to talk about, you know, the process and how easy it can be to get, get going with solar um, from our company perspective. And other companies do it maybe slightly a little different, but generally it's a very simple process. The installation is is pretty unobtrusive. So, I mean, people sometimes say, oh, well, I've got I've got to do so many big projects. I don't need another big project. It's actually not a big project because it only takes a day usually to install. And it's a very simple process of, of getting set up for it. So um, all you have to do to get going on solar is to call one of those solar installers and give them a copy of your electricity bill. They use that to do either an on-site assessment or a virtual site assessment. And that'll provide a customized analysis that's tailored to your home of how much energy you use and how much solar you need to offset as much of that energy as possible. Um, and then you'll, you'll see a preliminary design of what, uh, what solar will look like on your house and how much energy that will produce and how much of your electricity bill it will offset each month. Um, once you've looked at those numbers and you decide, yeah, this looks great, I wanna go for it. The next steps you know, for our company is we do an on-site assessment um, that involves actually flying a drone over your house. So we take about 8,000 pictures of, of your house and the trees around it uh, within about 10 minutes. And then we put all that into a software program that, that gives you a 3D model of your home that's very accurate and um, allows you to look at the solar array as it's been, you know, as it's been designed on your home from every different angle. Um, it's really kind of a cool tool and um, you get to look at that. Um, once you've approved that, you get to, once you look at that design, you say, yeah, that looks great. That's what I want. Um, you go on to the next stage of finalizing that design and the electrical design and engineering. Um, and finally, the permitting process. Um, for us, the whole process usually takes anywhere from four to eight weeks from the day you say, yes, I wanna do it to the day that it's turned on. Um, you know, there's a couple weeks at the end where you might be waiting for inspections and for a PSC to come by and flip the switch. Um, and so that can, it can vary quite, you know, four to eight weeks for us. To, uh, we're, we're moving pretty fast these days. So um, that's the process. And here's a little bit about what you would see. So I talked about that preliminary design. So uh, we do a virtual, uh, virtual site assessment where we use aerial imagery to uh, map out, you know, look at your home and and virtually with computer software, place as many panels on your home and uh, then do the modeling of how that, how that compares to your energy use throughout the course of the year. Um, you know, the software is pretty tech, pretty uh, sophisticated actually, uh, you know, uses, as you see on the right here, it uses this, uh, you know, time-lapse kind of um, modeling to, to look at the, how the shade affects your, your solar production and all that. And that's where you get uh, an estimate of for every kilowatt hour, for every kilowatt of solar you're installing, how much kilowatt hours you're gonna get out of that in a year. For this example, um, this person is getting 71% uh, of their energy offset and they're getting very good exposure here. It's, it's uh, 9,910 kilowatt hours a year. Uh, from a 9.49 kilowatt system. So, it, you know, multiply that 9.49 by 10,000, anything over that is, um, is really great. It's really gravy. Some homes that have more shading will, will see less than 9,000 kilowatt hours in their um, projection if they're, if, the, if they're not getting full solar exposure. So that's a little bit how that works. Um, when we uh, present the, uh, the, the financial analysis to you, we look at the total cost. Um, there are tax credits available, which I'll talk a little bit more if I have time, but there's a 26% federal tax credit that was recently extended for two more years. So it's available through, uh, through 2022, and then it goes down in 2023 and it's set to sunset 2024, but, uh, but hopefully the Congress will continue to extend that. Um, there's, uh, we, we offered a direct incentive for folks to work with us on a little bit of promotion. And then you look at this net cost and that's really what you have to think about as, you're, as what you're spending on the system overall after you get that tax credit back. Um, then you compare that to how much you're gonna, how, how much energy it's gonna produce and how much you'll save each month or each year and then each month. And then uh, 
you know, but the, of course, how much you're going to save uh, is based on your current energy use and the current electricity rates. But electricity rates keep going up every year. The average over the last 20 years is somewhere between four and six percent. And um, it's projected to actually, utility rates are projected to go up even faster um, in the years to come with all of the changes to the energy grid um, supply infrastructure with uh, changes off of coal and, and moving away from natural gas. So those rates are probably gonna keep going up higher. And, um, and so if it's only 5%, over 25 years, the system would save uh, Christina here uh, $49,000 on a, uh, and what that she would have spent on energy and electricity, but instead she bought a solar array that only only cost her thirteen thousand dollars. So that's where the the savings really comes in is that long term um, savings over a longer period of time. And there's great financing. Oh, sorry, I jumped. Uh, great financing available. I'm not going to get into these numbers down here, but it really shows how it can pencil out really quite quite quickly where you're where you're replacing your electricity bill with a loan payment that can be equal or less than uh, what you're spending on elect spending with utility, just within a couple of short years, you can be um, saving money, more money each year with that inflation rate of utility rates going up. So this is what the proposal looks like on our company. Um, and it's really more affordable than ever. The price of solar panels has come down about 90% since uh, 2009. Um, now, of course, panels themselves are not the only thing, labor and materials also have gone up. So overall, the, down, the installed cost is still down about two thirds from what it was just 10 years ago. Um, in, in Washington state, it's exempt from sales tax, tax and then you also have that 26% federal tax incentive that makes the, the, the solar array really pencil out nicely with a pretty quick uh, payback period for most, uh, most installs. As I mentioned, there's really attractive financing available from a couple of our uh, credit unions locally here, uh, Puget Sound Cooperative Credit Union that has uh, branches all around the, the you know, Puget Sound area and Generations Federal Credit Union, which has been based here in Olympia, but recently um, merged with another company in DuPont, another credit union. But these, these guys both have really great special solar loans that are designed specifically to help make it easy for folks like you to get into solar. Um, you can own your power with no money out of pocket, no money down. These loans don't require a down payment. They're usually 20 year loans that start at 4.74%. They could be a little bit less, uh, 4.5 or a little bit less, depending on how you, um, on your credit rating and your, um, and how you pay it back. And then they also allow you to re-amortize the principal after you get that tax return. If you apply it back to the principal on the loan, uh, they'll lower, it's basically like refinancing and it lowers the monthly payment, but you don't have to pay all the costs of refinancing. They do that once for free. Um, and so you can also, I don't know if, if everyone can see the line at the bottom, but you can include a new roof in the loan. You can include electrical upgrades that might be necessary to get your solar installed. Uh, also site work if you need to, you know, trim some trees or clear land, clear some, clear some ground for a ground mounted system. All of that can be included in the solar loan that um, allows you to get the job done. Uh, the installation itself, uh, as I said, it usually is, you know, happens from uh, around four to six weeks from, the, from when you start the process. Uh, of course, it could be a little longer depending on what happens, but, um, but it basically uh, is a very unobtrusive, non-intrusive um, installation that minimizes the penetrations in your roof. It's all warranted uh, for 10 years on labor and materials. So, any goes wrong the solar panels or the installation, you get a leak in your roof, um, that's covered under the warranty. And so, you know, the installation goes in, um, they connect it to the, uh, the main panel and uh, hook up the, there's an inverter that is the main brain of the, of the um, solar array that, that converts the electricity coming from the panels to a form you can use in your, in your outlets. And, um, and then once, it, once it's all installed and plugged in, it's connected to computers that uh, there's a cell card in there that, that uh, passes, transmits data to our office. And you can actually go on the web and, and monitor your solar array in real time, how much energy it's producing and how each panel is performing individually. It updates every 15 minutes and that comes free with all of our, uh, all of our installations. Um, and so um, this is all pretty standard for all of the different companies that do this. Uh, and then ultimately you get an inspection from the city 
you get an inspection from Puget Sound Energy and eventually they'll, um, you know, they'll change out your, your meter. Uh, you get, you go from a regular meter to a net meter that can actually spin backwards when you're, when you're racking up those credits in the summer months. Um, and so all of that gets done and eventually Puget Sound Energy says we're good to go. They flip the switch and um, you are uh, producing your own power. In just a few years, you can eliminate your energy bill. In a few years, you can be, uh, you know, basically saving money on energy every every year. You can have free power for the rest of your life. So it's really a, a great time to go solar and there's some wonderful programs available. I just want to mention quickly I mentioned earlier, Olympia Community Solar, it's a nonprofit in our community that's trying to make solar available to everyone in our community, regardless of whether they own their home or what their income level is. And so they've created a community solar projects that are allowing everyone to get into solar, even if they can't put panels on their own roof. So they're working right now on a group purchasing program called Solarize Thurston. Um, and it's a group purchasing for a, to, to uh, 100 homes to go solar in Thurston County. Um, already, I think already 70, 70 homes have signed up and or maybe more. I uh, haven't checked the numbers today, but um, but they are, uh, it's just, you know, pricing that's even less than what, you know, the the reduced pricing that we've seen over the, over the industry. Um, it sometimes can be about 20 to 25% less than market rates right now uh, for this special limited time group purchasing program by uh, by Olympia Community Solar. Um, and so if you want to get involved with that, go to their website, solarizethurston.org. Um, you can also learn more about Olympia Community Solar at olisol.org. And um, if you if you want to get into this, you sign up with uh, uh, their online form at solarizethurston.org. They'll schedule a free home, home or business site assessment. And then we, we contract with you uh, on or before September 1st and we get it installed. Um, that's that's what Solarize Thurston is, and Olympia Community Solar, as I mentioned, this uh, community nonprofit, and their mission really is to make equitable access for clean energy for everyone. And um, one of the ways they're doing that is community solar projects. Their latest one, I'm talking fast because I know I'm running out of time, their latest project is the Sunflower Community Solar Project, and it's going to be a 73 kilowatt array on the Olympia Farmers Market. And um, you know, they one of the things they do with this is they allow folks to buy buy up a, a share in the in the community solar project, and you can either take the credit yourself and and you get money back for the power your 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 portion of the array is producing, or you can donate that to a low income community um, with the Solarize program. Olympic Community Solar is donating uh, solar access. To Low income community members um, for every 50 kilowatts that are installed through the program. So uh, that's kind of how we're working with them to uh, increase the equity involved. Um, I don't know if Kirk will get a chance, but they're also working with some of the tribes in the area. Uh, great video that just came out um, with uh, Sound Solar working with the uh, uh, the Quinault Indian Nation out in Tola. So that's a little bit. Of, that's all I got to say for now. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, the audience has been doing a great job of hanging in, even though we're kind of over time. Um, but I think it's because the quality of the information is so good. Um, I am going to ask Lisa Parsley to talk for just about two minutes, and then we're going to do question and answer. Uh, so Lisa is going to talk about, like, now you heard all these things, what you can do to your home. What is what is energy efficiency got to do with the climate mitigation plan is what Lisa is going to talk about. Thank you, Lynn. And um, I have to do a personal thank you to Thurston Climate Action Team. One, um, we have to acknowledge that the climate mitigation plan is in place in large part because of the activism and advocacy that was put forward by this group. Um, what can energy efficiency? I've, I've been listening. I haven't always had my video on because one, my dogs and my clients, uh, dogs, have been barking and I've had to do things, but I, I have actually learned quite a bit, um, including um, how to, to actually do an energy audit. That was fabulous, um, by the way. Um, I really particularly like the infrared um, showing where your energy escape is. Back to how this fits into climate mitigation in two ways. We know that buildings, both residential and commercial are the largest part of our carbon problem in Thurston County. 
So if we're going to have the biggest impact on and get to our goals, which, by the way, I just pointed out to the city staff yesterday, it may be nine years to we're to a point of no return in climate, but we're nine years to our first goal. We've got some work to get going. Um, so if we're going to have the biggest impact to get to those goals, we're going to have to work on energy efficiency. We're going to have to work on our buildings, not only the new buildings, but retrofitting. And programs like this are going to be key because the city governments can only do so much. We need the community to get out and work on their own properties and encourage other people to do that. The second piece, which I thought Chris's last one did fantastic, all this is going to have a dollar bill attached to it. How do we make this possible financially? And believe me, one of the things about the climate mitigation plan phase four that we're going to have to talk about is incentives. How are we also going to make ready uh, amounts of money? No interest, low interest loans. How are we going to take advantage of hopefully some of the things that are going to come out of Biden's administration so that we can bring that into Thurston County? encouraging the Thurston County uh, Commission to finish their work on CPACER. So these kinds of webinars are gonna be critical to achieving our goals. It's gonna get community members doing it, it's gonna help us finance it, and we're gonna work on the sole biggest carbon footprint in our area, which is energy efficiency in our buildings. So thanks for showing up tonight and thank you TCAT once again for the work you do. Thanks, Lisa. Um, okay, we are to question and answer now. And I know I have at least three in the chat box and people can um, add more or you can raise your hand if you have more. So uh, one question, and this one was, I think for Garen, was are there cases where it would make sense to just do an infrared test? So if you sort of knew you don't have ducks and you knew some stuff about your windows already and blah, blah, blah. Um, would that make sense? Yeah, I, I could see where that could make sense, especially if you've gone, if you already know some of the other things. Um, I mean, there'd be a lot that we wouldn't know at the end of, you know, looking around. And, and really what the infrared camera is, if you think about it, you're just shining it around and if you can see a lot of heat loss difference between the inside and the outside, you're going to zero in on that spot or you're going to look at the house in general. You know that, the, that there's a difference in temperature, but you don't know what's causing that temperature um, difference. Um, and an example of that, air can create a difference in temperature, but water can as well. So we've seen situations where we thought there was air movement through, but there was actually a water leak from the second story to the first story. And that's what was causing the temperature difference to show up on the camera. So it was a good thing we found the problem because it ended up being, you know, water damage is a bigger than, than air leakage. Um, but without some of the other tests, it's hard to determine exactly what's going on there. But yeah, it, it's, uh, it tells part of the story and uh, I could see some value in doing that. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think this question sort of got addressed, but there was a question in here, and I guess this one would be for Adam. Does PSE ins have incentives for solar panel installation? Yeah, so that one um, was, was answered. Um, there is no specific PSE incentives for, for solar, but um, if you talk to your solar installer, you'll see that there is um, both state and federal incentives, uh, as Chris had, had alluded to earlier. Okay. I would uh, also add that um, PSC has some really great programs for um, making solar energy accessible to low-income communities. There's grant programs that are uh, helping um, get solar onto affordable housing and into other community program, you know, community skit, you know, individual homes um, through partnerships with uh, nonprofit groups like Olympia Community Solar and others. Um, so there was a question in here that uh, Kirk just addressed himself too, but um, the question was, what should we look for? in sol uh, solar cell installation program in order to avoid scams or less desirable plans. And 
Kirk said the obvious thing, make sure you get more than one bid, but um, anything yeah. you want to add to that? Chris? Well, I would agree with that. I think, you know, getting, talking to two or three companies, getting different bids, uh, with most of them, when you when you start the conversation, you'll be able to tell you should be able to tell within the first five minutes if you're dealing with a reputable company and just the way they approach it. Um, but uh, but then you know do your due diligence and you know find find out more about the company and um, and uh, ask for references of others who have, have worked with them to see if uh, and then talk to the folks to see if they like uh, you know liked how their experience was so. Um, you know, it's, you know, you know, another great way to go is to is to go with a company that has been doing solar in the local community for a while and, and avoiding um, ones that are just kind of show up all of a sudden and you don't know where they're coming from. So, yeah, things like that. Thank you. Um, I think this next question is probably for Matt. The question is, air exchange and signal single residences, is there or was there a requirement in Washington building codes for air exchange through your furnace air conditioner from the outside a few times a day? Matt, you're um, muted. Muted. Sorry, one of our other presenters might be able to address that. There, there is, um, there is, in fact, I'm guessing maybe Chris, but there are, um, I've got that one. The two oh, Karen, Karen. Okay, I was going to say there's not, to my knowledge, but Garen can probably address yeah, that. The, the 2015 Energy Code, Washington State Energy Code, requires <laughs> all homes that are new constructed to have an air change per hour rate of five or less. Um, the 2018 Code, which passed and went into effect in February of this year, still requires at a minimum to have it be at five. But if you if a builder chooses to bring that down to three, um, they get um, one. They can get energy code credit. So from now on, in the energy code, um, any builder has to get six credits that address energy reduction. And um, this is one that the lower you get, the more points you can get. And a, and a builder can choose to mix or match. Um, uh, using lots of different technologies to get that six. So the, the minimum is five air changes an hour and they start getting credit towards their um, six points if they go below three um, air changes per hour. Right, and just to address that further, it's not a requirement as far as I understand that there are air exchanges through your furnace or air conditioner. It's just the, Correct. yeah, exactly. Yeah, one thing I would just mention about this, I mean, it's built into the code that if you get to that low of it, if you get to at that air tight of a building, that there's also uh, ventilation that brings fresh air into the building. Because if you if you build tight, there's the old saying, if you build tight, you have to ventilate right. And, um, you know, and that's built into the code. But if you're doing improvements on your own home, um, that's where Garen's service comes in to really help you understand, like, if you're going to seal up your home this much, you have to find a way to make sure you're getting the fresh air changes um, and, and make sure it's not coming through the basement in the in the attic. Yeah, correct. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Chris mentioned that we have uh, another uh, area expert on here who is Kirk Hafner. I just want to give Kirk a chance. Is there anything you want to throw in, Kirk, that you feel didn't get said tonight? <laughs> Wow, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, no, great job. What a wonderful presentation. And uh, yeah, I did take some notes and uh, uh, would like to uh, address a few things, uh, both in questions and in, in um, encouragement. Um, Chris had mentioned with Community Solar uh, about the opportunity to invest in community solar. We often recommend community solar for people that do not have a good solar site uh, yeah. because our company and others uh, often will tell people, no, if you do not have a good site, we do not recommend solar. We don't want to put solar will, will not work or the panels are at risk because of falling debris or branches or things like that. But more importantly, it's getting back to the other presenters. Um, oftentimes we get to a site and a homeowner say I have a real high energy bill and for that that raises a red flag. Uh, why do you have a really high energy bill? And when we see 
um, electric baseboard heating, or recently I just had a neighbor that wanted to do solar and I climbed up in the attic and there was zero insulation. I said, no, I don't want to do solar. You need to add uh, the three key tenants that Matt and Adam and others will add to is energy efficiency, conservation, and air sealing are kind of the big three that we see. So we'll recommend that first. And it, it's surprising. Uh, we actually got a five-star rating one time because the, the comment was we told them no, you know, where somebody else wanted to sell them solar. Um, so, you know, we really want you to in, invest in, in your home first for comfort. And Chris mentioned that. Um, a little bit of difference. Chris mentioned the, the, the process. Uh, just one thing that's an ethic for our company. We won't um, ask for a signature until we've been on site. We really feel it's important to take a look at the roof and take a look at the site firsthand, not via satellite. Uh, because honestly, Google and some of the other software just isn't accurate. We want to look at the electrical panel. We want to look at the routing. And, um, and Chris will agree on this. We want to talk to both uh, 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 or, or all <laughs> of the occupants of the house. Um, you know, there's many times where one partner has a great idea and the other partner doesn't quite agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and encourage the person to talk to the boss and bring them on the next. Meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, but it's still what she says oftentimes. Mm -hmm, right? That's right. That's um, what goes. Uh, Chris also mentioned, you know, the calculation, which is good year one estimates. One thing I would like to caution about, though, is the tax rebate. And we've seen instances where people are including work in the loan that is not eligible for the tax credit. So you really need to talk to a tax advisor. And also the IRS has a great site and FAQ. I'm gonna pat myself on the back because I helped get it up there. Um, if you look for the energy credit, uh, um, it's very clear that it is for the energy property only. Um, it's the second line in the FAQ on the IRS tech site. Um, we do know of people that were audited and uh, uh, punitively, unfortunately, because they were told something else by a company that's no longer in business. Um, but you know, you, you've got to make sure, uh, consult a tax professional and, and do what you think is best and ethical. Um, and so those were some of the things, but otherwise, you know, the, the key thing on this is um, we're talking about energy efficiency, conservation, renewable energy generation, changing the world one you know uh improvement at a time to lower our carbon footprint and hopefully we can do better for this planet that has nurtured us so well thank you thank you kirk thank you kirk i was trying to say that and the mic wasn't on um we have had such a great panel i just want to give the audience one last chance to like raise your paddle hand or turn your camera on and raise your actual hand uh, to see if we have any other question before we call it a night. Yeah, Christina, turn your mic on. There you go. Yep. Sorry. And I'm kind of like Lisa where I'm dodging dogs. I've been in the field all day. So I got home and my dogs are crazy right now. So how dare I leave them at home for seven hours? You know, not that they did anything but sleep, but now that I'm home, they're barking at everything. So my apologies if they go off. Um, I think, yes, thank you for the presentation, much appreciated. Um, Garen, since our topic with realtors has been the point of sale audit, I would love, 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 I mean, I loved your overview of what you do, but I would love to see an actual audit. And um, I've got your information, so I'll email you, but I think, Lynn, that'd be something that we should share with our sub task force, the actual printed out version, you know, whether it's a copy one or whatever, but would love to see it outright full audit. So sure. that would be great. Yeah. And Garrett's if, I, great if I could uh, just put that into context a little bit, uh, TCAT, Thurston Climate Action Team, has been working with uh, the Climate Mitigation Plan Steering Committee and the Thurston County Realtors Association to work out one of the actions in the climate plan, which is about uh, requiring energy audits at the point of sale that'll, that would report to the owner, the seller, and the buyer what the, um, you know, what are some of the energy efficiency improvements that they can do on a, a 10 year or less payback period. And so um, we're working on that. that. That will eventually go into a policy probably at the city level. And um, yeah, I'm looking for, uh, yeah. you know, we're gonna have- and It might be something together. great just to work with you, Garen, maybe on a, a separate presentation to the group, yeah, just so we can have fine. the overview. So perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, no. yeah. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate the information. 
Uh, Garen's given some great information to Chris that we will probably try to roll into to what's happening. Okay. Um, any good. other questions, anybody? Yeah, Barb. Um, actually, it's more of a comment. I just want to uh, let you know, Kirk's company installed uh, 12 solar panels on a pergola in our backyard about 11 years ago. Uh, because there was too much shade, too many trees in the front yard. And those panels are still producing uh, the amount of electricity that Kirk had, um, you know, anticipated. And, and, and I love them. Awesome. <laughs> well, that's a good commercial for solar. Uh, okay, anybody else got a last one before we say goodnight to each other? All right, well, thank you again for Thanks both to our presenters for doing such a great job and then for the audience for um, hanging in here for a pretty long presentation, but I have to say a really uh, educational one. So thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.